the night course, shaping the way we teach English. Webinar Wednesday. Good morning from Washington, D.C., and welcome to Shaping the Way We Teach English, Webinar Course 12, brought to you by the American English Team. Welcome back to all of our teachers who have been here before, and welcome to anyone who is joining us for the first time. So as you know, today is the last day of Webinar Course 12, but don't worry, Webinar Course 13 is just around the corner. So we're excited to announce our new schedule, and you can see it here on the screen. The next course will begin April 30th, so if you are interested in participating, you do need to register through your RELO or U.S. Embassy. As all of you already know, the webinar features include the chat box, which is where you can ask your presenter questions, participate in activities, and discuss the topic with your colleagues from around the world. We hope you all answered the poll at the beginning of today's webinar. And if you do lose sound, please feel free to follow along in the caption pod so you'll be able to hear see what the presenter is saying. We do offer e-certificates for participants that join at least four out of six webinars. Since this is the end of course 12, our e-certificates will be issued within the next couple weeks. These are issued from your RELO or U.S. Embassy and not from Washington, D.C. So if you do have questions about those, please contact your RELO or U.S. Embassy. In order to make sure you're eligible for e-certificates, we need you to submit your attendance at the very end of each webinar. Either just your email address or if you are watching this webinar with a group, then include the number of participants. We hope that all of you have already joined the Ning. The Ning is a website where you can access readings related to each webinar, resources, the PowerPoint, the recording, and also you can continue the discussion about each topic with the presenter and your colleagues. Other ways to access content from the American English team is by downloading our app which is especially useful because today we will be talking about how to use cell phones in the classroom. This app is for basic phones and Android phones and gives lots of great features to any of your phones as well as gives more access to content related to teaching and learning English. You can also like us on Facebook and check out our YouTube channel. Finally, another great way to get teaching and learning resources is by visiting our website AmericanEnglish.state.gov. So as you know, today's topic is about cell phones. So our title today is Don't Put Your Cell Phone Away, Cell Phones in the Classroom. And this webinar will explore the many ways a cell phone can enhance learning and inject fun into your language classroom. Our presenter today is Scott Chiverton. Scott is an experienced teacher trainer and is currently a regional English language officer in Washington, D.C. He has taught in Brazil, Angola, South Africa, Bangladesh, and Bahrain. And he is excited to share what he's done with cell phones in his classroom. So welcome, Scott. Thank you, Jenny. Good morning to some of you, good evening to others, and maybe even good afternoon to some others. Uh, welcome to Webinar Wednesday. As Jenny said, I'm Scott Chiverton, and today we are going to talk about a really interesting topic, I hope for many of you, um, talking about cell phones in the classroom. Uh, I really thought it was interesting to see in the chat box, or not the chat box, the poll today that uh, nearly 100% of the people who answered the poll said they had a cell phone, which I think is a really interesting statistic uh, given that there are so many out there in the world. So um, I would like to start today uh, by 
asking you this question. How many cell phones were in use worldwide? Uh, we'll start out with in 2007. Maybe in 2010. So if you want to take a guess for what, how many cell phones you think were in use in 2007, we've got, looks like a lot of people are saying a million, 100,000. Well, in 2007, there were 1.8 billion cell phones in use. So that was seven years ago. In 2010, does anyone want to take a guess? Ah, Khadija, you're very, very, very close. You said 3.8 billion in 2010. There's actually 3 billion. And in 2014, six billion, nine billion, five billion, ten billion. Well, the number I have is 4.8 billion. Uh, I've read some statistics that say that might be, by the end of the year, it might be getting closer to 6 billion. And I think that statistic is really telling um, because there are 7 billion people in the world. Um, and I think, you know, in 2024, how many cell phones are there going to be? How many people are there going to be? It is a device that n nearly everyone in the world has access to. Um, and I think that's something that we should consider. Uh, so uh, thank you for your guesses. And let's do our first activity. No workshop or lesson would be good without a nice, simple warm-up. So I'd like to start out with one for everybody today. Um, Take a look at my picture here. Yeah, that is me uh, in sunnier weather. It's a bit cold here today in D.C., so uh, I wouldn't be uh, uh, wearing a T-shirt and sunglasses. I guarantee that. Um, but my first question to you is, how do you think that picture was taken? Good job, Koji. It was taken with a cell phone. So the next question I have for you is, when do you think I took the picture? In the summer? 2007? 2014? Uh, I actually took the picture in 2011, and it was in July. So... Uh, in the northern hemisphere would be summer, but actually down in in that part of the world, I'm giving you a clue, it was winter. Who do you think took the picture? My friend, girlfriend, friend, niece, a friend. Well, ah, someone has it. Uh, it was my wife. Uh, she took the picture in 2011 with her cell phone. Um, many of you people have said where you think I was, but any ideas where I was? Maybe location? On the beach, yeah. South Africa, no, okay. Ulyana in Kazakhstan has got it right. I was in Brazil in a famous beach in Brazil. And of course, Adriano got it right because Adriano's from Brazil. And finally, the last question, why do I like this picture? <laughs> uh, memory, a good memory, okay. Uh, that's right. That was... So it is a good memory because in 2000, 
I actually gave you the wrong date. It was 2012. <laughs> in 2012, that was two weeks after uh, my wife and I got married, and we were down in in Rio visiting some friends. And um, on a Sunday afternoon, we walked down close to the water, and she took that picture. So that's why I like that picture because it's a good memory. Um, it was at the end of our honeymoon. I was actually going to the uh, local English language teachers conference down there and so we were stopped and saw some friends but that's why that picture is uh, is good for me and this is a great example of how you can use a picture from a cell phone um, with your students and ask some very simple questions and really personalize the learning so I'm going to talk a little bit more about how to use photos with cell phones um, that many of you have already talked about so uh, let's move on to today's goals. Uh, I hope by the end of today that you walk away with activities that you can do with cell phones. Uh, I hope that you understand how certain cell phone activities can reduce the effective filter and get students interacting with the language or in other words getting those students who seem really shy to want to talk to actually talk and I can explain how that I've seen that happen and finally explain the difference between using cell phones for self-study for internet usage and for classroom activities um, one thing I do want to stress today is that some of the activities that I'm showing um, don't necessarily um, need a smartphone or um, one of the phones that connect to the internet. I'm trying to use phones that you can use the basic functions of a phone so that uh, you don't rely too much on um, things that like the data packages that could be expensive or text messaging which sometimes can be expensive as well. So um, I just wanted to let you know that and um, we will explore a little bit more on that as we go along and I think I'm going to get a lot of good ideas for many of you. So, um, do you see this sign in your school from the earlier conversations? I think the answer to many of, to, for many of you will be yes. Um, and I understand that cell phones are something that make school officials nervous. They make teachers nervous. It's very hard to... Um, control and so you know it's it's something that you know even here in the US five to seven years ago um, cell phones cell phones were frowned upon um, and if you look at a lot of the papers and the literature that is out there um, many schools are starting to change their opinion and starting to embrace cell phones um, as I said earlier you know they're four point eight billion cell phones in the world um, they're not going anywhere they're going to stay so it might be something that we want to look about um, look look at and see that you know maybe instead of um, trying to get rid of them we might try and figure out how to include them so one of the reasons some of the reasons I think are good of why we should use cell phones is in many places around the world uh, students don't have access to computers um, or audiovisual equipment so students like cell phones um, and I'd like to put up a poll and ask how many of your students have a cell phone seventy five to hundred percent already wow Okay, uh, that is a really big number. 85% uh, of your students have cell phones, and I think that is something to really keep in mind as we go through this today. Um, 
So the other reason to use cell phones is I think it gives students an opportunity to use English in a non-threatening way. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, cell phones engage learners with a technology tool that they like and understand and often know better than we do, uh, when, than the teachers do. Um, and in some of the activities I'm going to show you today, they produce a product and they see an end goal. So um, those are some reasons that you can use to talk to people about why you should use cell phones. Um, here's another quick activity uh, in the chat box. Um, quickly take out your cell phone if it's not already out and tell us your favorite feature on your cell phone. It can be anything that you like or you use regularly or anything that you like about your cell phone. The color, the style, the 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 size. But what is your favorite feature on your cell phone? Is it the camera? Is it are is the buttons? The mail? <laughs> All right, camera and sending messages. It's gold. <laughs> All right, convenience, photos, message box. There's so many things. Um, so here's another you know, short little activity that you can do um, in a class. Someone on the Ning actually talked about this, that they did this with a group of adults, and I wouldn't do this for more than, I put three to five minutes, but you could even keep it, um, you know, shorter to two, two maybe three minutes. Um, one thing that if you know many of your students in your class don't have a cell phone, um, they can talk about the features that they would like a cell phone to have or the features that they would like to see in a cell phone and this might be a way to avoid making students feel um, bad that they don't have one so um, you know that's something to consider when you know that there are many students in your class that don't have one or you can use a fictitious activity saying okay you have an opportunity to buy a cell phone what are the features that you want to look for um, so you can use it like that when you know people don't have them so um, how have cell phones changed the way we communicate? Um, there are so many ways. I, I you know, I, every day I come in and I see, you know, people just on their cell phone constantly. It's even changed the way that people interact. Uh, they communicate instantaneously and expect responses instantaneously. Um, some people think this is good. Some people think this is bad. I think, uh, um, you know, everything is good in moderation. So, um, you know, I think that's something to consider. But cell phones, there's no denying it. They have changed the way that we communicate. Um, in some places around the world, uh, cell phones have helped bring about social change. Um, countries that I can think of off of the top of my head, um, you know, Egypt, Tunisia, Brazil, Ukraine, Iran. Um, these countries, uh, people have gotten messages out to the world through, you know, Twitter and Facebook and messaging uh, to let people know what's going on even before the news agencies get out there. And so it's even changed the way news uh, broadcasters focus on getting their information. So, um, you know, phones have definitely made an effort to um, or have played a big part in bringing change around the world. Um, can any of you think of some other ways that phones, cell phones have changed the way we communicate? Brought the world to your, on your hand a little bit closer. Um, it is true. You can really communicate with people all around the world. Um, it reduces face-to-face -face communication. Ludmila from Kazakhstan says that, and you know I couldn't agree more. Um, one of the things I, I often watch is when I see two people out at dinner or lunch or sitting at a table. Um, they, I, I, I try to pay attention to how often one person or the other looks at their phone. Um, they've changed the way language is used um, in languages all around the world. Um, there is writing language and then there is text language um, and those are definitely completely different so there are a lot of ways that um, 
it's changed the way we communicate. Um, Marcia from Brazil says people have been writing more. I think that's kind of interesting. They have been writing more, and there are definitely different ways in which people write. So, um, yeah, there are lots of different ways that phones have changed the way we communicate. And I wanted to talk about, you know, how I've seen schools are using phones. Um, the first example I wanted to tell you was to teach math. Um, one specific example that I, I came across was that a math teacher uh, did an experiment and he used polling from his students as a response system. Um, they, he's used it as a research tool and a tool for collecting evidence of student work through photos and video. So um, there's a website I came across the other day that this math teacher used for polling and it's called polleverywhere.com and I haven't really done anything with it but I, I think that is a way for you to get students to you know send instant communication on a poll rather than getting them to just raise their hands which is something that's really difficult so that's how that math teacher used um, cell phones in his class and to teach reading um, I wanted to give you the example that many of you have faced. Um, they teach reading through sending short messages, downloading chapters from books onto um, basic phones. But one thing I want you to consider, which I think is, is great, is how many of you have ever tried to get your students to do a reading and you say, okay, pull out your books. And the students say, oh, well, I forgot my book or your school doesn't have enough books. Um, to, to use for all the students. So, you know, one saying that you can think about is students never forget their phones, but for some reason they always seem to forget their books. So this is one of the ways that you can use to teach reading and get reading to students. Um, you know, it's not uh, the easiest way, but I think it's something to consider because, like I said, students never forget their phones if they're allowed to bring them. So, um, browse for meanings and information or interview someone as a class reporter as well. Um, those are other ways you can do it. So, um, those are two examples of, of uh, ways I've seen people use phones. Other ways schools use phones are to use them to connect to the internet and to use them like mini computers and in some instances they're <laughs> Some of the phones these days are more powerful than some of the very simple computers. So, um, you know, those are those are different ways that people can use. Um, and many of you have talked about um, other ways to use cell phones are using the dictionary functions that phones have, um, short video clips, um, or posting to a class website when possible. So. Um, you know, those are some ways that we can use phones. Um, again, I ask you this question, how can language classes use phones? Or I say use cell phones. Um, some of you have talked about creating vocabulary lists um, with notes. Uh, do you see those cell phones that have the note feature where you can, you know, make a list of to-dos? And that is a nice way to get people to, you know, maybe remember their homework. Um, instead of having them write it down on a piece of paper that they lose, they can try and uh, note it down on a piece of paper or on their cell phone, and then it's hopefully recorded in there. Um, and I also also thought about keeping a journal. Um, in there, you know, you don't have to write a lot. It could be a sentence a day. Um, using a spell corrector, um, Ketnet in Kosovo has uh, mentioned that, and I think that's pretty good. I don't have that on my phone, but it would be a nice um, application that I could use. So, you know, there are so many ways, and I hope that we can continue this conversation after because, um, you know, this is something that we all still are exploring and learning a lot about. So, um, the more information I get from you, all the better. Um, I wanted to tell you it's time for another poll. Um, 
I wanted to ask you what percentage, nope, does your school allow cell phones? This one, I think it, we might get an even split. Um, Thirty-one percent, thirty-two percent say yes, forty-four percent say no, and twenty-three percent, twenty-two say only with permission. Um, I like that idea of only with permission because, um, you know, as I said earlier, everything is good in moderation, and we all have to have some kind of rules and guidance on how to use things. So that's really, really good. Good. So. Um, I wanted to go through what I'm going to call, I'm going to try to name, is our new cell phone policy um, on classroom activities. Uh, so I'm going to go through um, about two or three activities to give you ideas on how to use cell phones. Many of you are using them in this way already, uh, but I thought I would go ahead and introduce something interesting to you. So as we did earlier, I talked about using a photo from a cell phone. Um, here's another way I was thinking about using photos. Uh, you could talk about places. Um, send your students out uh, to take a photo of a group of buildings or places to describe using prepositions. Um, is one or in the idea that you were teaching or getting them to focus on prepositions um, or even names of places. Um, you could also do an activity where you have them take pictures of places and they use specific adjectives to describe the buildings, which is what I would like you to do with this cell phone picture that I took um, about two or three years ago. So um, I gave you a little e example here. Um, this is a, um, and then you can fill that in with whatever you like. Uh, maybe you can throw up uh, um, some of your ideas. So this is a, I would call this, this is a diner, okay? You can say restaurant, tea shop, um, but actually this is a diner um, or a small restaurant. Um, it's, what do you think? It's... Is it old? Is it new? Is it pretty? <laughs> it's compact. It's a diner. Great job in the Philippines there. Um, it's small. It's old. It's a convenience store. It's expensive. It's classic. I like that one uh, from Bolivia, Gabby. Uh, it's classic, yeah. I'll tell you, my dad loved this uh, little place. It's, it's old. It's... Um, but inside, these types of restaurants usually have um, very good food. In the U.S., we call these um, kind of dive restaurants. Uh, dive meaning that they're, they're not the most popular places and they're often uh, not well known, but they tend to have really good foods. Um, so what do you think they sell? There's some clues there. Coffee, sure. Java. <laughs> uh, tea. Fast food. Okay. Traditional. Well, if you look, if you have really good eyes, you can see that they sell cheeseburgers and they sell hot dogs and they probably sell a whole bunch of other stuff too. Um, uh, but that doesn't really matter because the idea is, is that they get a, a lot of practice talking about what they see. They could say it's peach colored. It's it's got two windows, it's got three doors, um, you know, there's a lot of things that they can talk about. So um, that's just one activity where you can focus on either prepositions or adjectives. Um, and I'm sure you could come up with other ways to use this, this, uh, this type of a photo. So another type of photo you can use um, is an activity that I like to call English All Around Us. In most countries, um, there are there are lots of English words, lots of English phrases, 
whether they're on menus or signs in hotels or restaurants or on billboards. Um, there are there are lots of signs. There may not be um, they may not be super easy to find, but you know they are there and they're out there. So um, I like to send students out to discover English in their environment. Um, out of curiosity, looking at this sign, do you notice anything interesting about it? Um, Mamura in Uzbekistan says there are not many signs in English, so maybe you know they can look for uh, they can look for things on the internet. There are there are many signs in English that talk about um, or that show um, English in different countries, and they can look at it that way. Um, but definitely in the big hotels and um, many kind of more popular restaurants, they might be able to find some of the English um, out there. Um, but anyway, I wanted to tell you what's interesting about this is, the first, if you look at this word pass passenger, um, um, I noticed only after I put this picture up that it was spelled wrong. Um, and they are just missing a letter or missing two letters so that's something they can kind of pay attention to and then the other one is the word parked um, this is not incorrect it's just a, a different type of a, a usage of parked and you can talk to students about um, you know word collocations you can talk to them about direct translations you know normally we talk about the word parked like parking a car or parking a bicycle um, but we don't usually talk about parking an elevator. Um, usually, we might it, we might like to choose the word "stopped" at this floor. So you could talk about um, you know direct kind of translations and um, get an idea for students to understand how how they should be working with word choices. So um, as I said, it's not incorrect. Um, it's just a it's you know it's something that you wouldn't normally find um, it's kind of the wrong choice of a word so it's a really good opportunity to talk about you know word choices um, you can call this instead of English around us you can call it English detectives um, so you want to encourage students to be English language detectives whenever they find signs in English they should take a picture of it um, I was thinking today um, for the next time I'm out um, in working with teachers around the world that I could use some of the signs that I see around the city of Washington DC because there are so many and I started taking pictures today just with my phone because um, if I don't take them I won't have them <laughs> so um, that's one thing you can do so finally the last way you can use a photo which many students often have in their phones um, are photos of family and friends um, so if you take a look at this picture, um, this is my family, um, and on the ends of the table, you'll see my parents, my mother and my father, and then on the left side of the table, uh, you see my three nieces, and on the right, you see two of my nephews and my sister-in-law and my brother-in-law. What's really funny <laughs> about this picture is neither my brother, my sister, nor I are in this picture. Um, so I, uh, when I looked at this picture, I just thought it was really funny. Um, they are obviously all sitting down to a formal type of a dinner. It's not something that is um, happens every day. Um, I think this was a holiday. Um, probably Thanksgiving, which is pretty popular here, in the, which is a, a really big American holiday. Um, and so, you know, I take this picture, I talk about it, and then I'm going to ask you some questions. So, who are these people? Nice, Safan, a get-together. I like you how she said that. Um, they're my relatives. Yeah, it's my whole family. Great. Okay, the next question, where are they?
They're in the dining room. Great job, Liana. Um, and what are they doing? Oops. Went too far. Sorry about that. Okay, what are they doing? Um, any of you said having a meal, sitting down to a um, traditional dinner. Um, it's a way, this is another way for me to talk about using pictures um, to talk about cultural events, family, food even. Um, one of the things people love to do with cell phones these days is taking pictures of food and then talking about it. There's nothing better than taking um, pictures of something that is 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 something you like to you like to make or you like to eat and tell people about it talking about favorites so um, that's three ways that you can use photos um, some procedures for using cell phone photos uh, you can ask um, students to pair up or get in groups um, you know, if you have a big classroom, you might just want to have them turn to the person behind them or in front of them and talk to those people. Um, you can have, you tell that you ask them to take out their phone, choose a picture, or in some cases teachers can send pictures or send students out on an assignment to take pictures of something um, on a theme or, or focus on a grammar point. Um, they can show a picture of a family member, a food, a place, an event, or something meaningful to them. And then they can talk about where, when, why they took the picture or like the picture, thinking about, you know, on terms of language focus, talking about time and locations and giving opinions. Um, who or what is in the picture? So things that come up in, in, in books and and um, lessons are family and descriptions and adjectives, and this is a way for vocabulary development as well. Uh, finally, uh, they could take a picture and write short stories about the picture using recently learned vocabulary or structures. Um, creative thinking, this um, promotes creative thinking and idea development. So they don't need to write using the phone, but they can use the picture on the phone as a way to get to um, to begin writing. Um, so that's a way to kind of use it for more advanced levels, maybe. Um, you might have some ideas on how to adapt this for uh, um, real beginners and more advanced levels. So. Um, that's one of the things that you can do with cell phone pictures, and I'm sure many of you have other ideas. Um, Shubada says for beginners it can be used for teaching them writing, speaking, and even vocabulary. Um, writing short stories is an interesting activity, and I think there are more that you can do with it. So. The next activity is one of my favorites, and if you looked at the resources on the Ning, you might have even seen a couple of examples. Um, many of you may have heard of digital stories. Well, what I've come up with here is cell phone stories. Um, digital stories usually involve editing um, and and computer work and cell phone stories are something that you can do in a class period and actually get a result at, um, and really have students um, produce something interesting. So uh, I'm going to walk you through the procedure on how to do this. Um, so how I did it was is I put students in groups of three or four. I didn't want to put any more than that. You could probably put up to five but probably no more than that. Um, this is a great activity in case not all students in the class have a cell phone. Um, you only need one cell phone for the group. Um, and the cell phone needs to have minimal, at minimum it needs to have video, photo, and microphone capability, which most basic phones have that these days, but um, again, putting them in groups helps you at least get the chance of finding one person who has this ability. Um, so the scenario I'm going to present to you today um, is for beginners 
they're going to introduce themselves to others. So what they do is they create a short cell phone story that gives the gives us, the, the audience, their names, where they're from, where they live, and two activities that they like to do. Um, one thing I want you to consider, is this activity possible without a cell phone? The answer is yes. It is, it is possible without a cell phone, um, but I found that the students get a little bit more enjoyment by recording themselves with it. Um, and they actually get a lot more practice, and I'll tell you about that in a second here. So I give the students a storyboard. If you're not familiar what a storyboard is, it's, uh, it's used for, it's often what um, filmmakers use, and I adapted it by making, basically you design your story before you say it or write it. So um, I gave the students six, a piece of paper with six boxes, and underneath each box you had uh, lines to write, and I asked them to draw out their scene or their idea and then write what they would say underneath it. So that introduces, um, and it says they use a storyboard to design one to two minute story that introduces their group to other groups. So this is an example of a storyboard. Um, I used Obviously, I used the computer here, um, and I used pictures that I pulled from either my computer or my phone, but in reality, in the classroom, you actually have students drawing on the piece of paper their whatever they like, um, whatever they feel like, and then underneath it, they have the lines to write the sentence. So here's my storyboard. Um, very easy. My name's Scott Chiverton. I come from Placerville, California in the USA, but... I live in Washington, D.C. I like Washington, D.C. There are many fun things to do. I really like to ride my bike when I have free time, usually on Saturdays and Sundays. Um, I also like to use my camera to take pictures. And now you know a little bit about me. Tell me about you. And so the students design this, this storyboard, and they drew, and one of the things that came up which I thought was so interesting is after they did it I thought they would get up and and video themselves doing the scene but what happened was that they actually videoed the storyboard and talked behind the photos so um, after they finished their storyboard and I took a look at it um, they got a chance to use their phone and they film their story, um, and like I said, they can use pictures, they can draw, um, they can use realia, or anything they like. They want to bring the story to life. Um, and one of the things that was really cool is that they can do it more than once if needed. So what happened, what I noticed was that students, after they recorded it, and some of those students who didn't want to get in front of the camera, stood behind it and talked with the storyboard. Again, you can see this uh, two examples in the resources section on the Ning. Um, so if you want to see those videos, you can, you can take a look at them. Um, but what it promoted was that um, students, oh, hold on, students repeated because they wanted to get it right. Um, and it was so, so cool because they all said, no, I don't like that one. I want to do it again. And so it, it promoted repetition, which was something I didn't even expect. Um, and it was natural repetition without me having to encourage them. So my biggest challenge was how would I get the video file from the students? Because, you know, we like to collect students' work if possible. Um, there are a few ways that you can do this. Um, once the students filmed the videos, uh, they all said, hey, we can send it to you via Bluetooth, and I didn't even think about that, but it was the easiest method, um, and that's what many of them do these days to share videos, to share uh, music, um, and it's, it's the easiest. I I'm, I'm, might be wrong, but I think it's probably the cheapest. Um, 
They can send it to a teacher's computer via Bluetooth. If your computer has Bluetooth, um, you can have them send it to your computer. That's a little bit more difficult because not all computers have that. Um, another easy way um, is you can connect it to a computer with a USB cord, um, which works pretty well. And then finally, I think um, the two last ones, you can students can send a multimedia message to the teacher's phone. And finally, the hardest, because the files are often really, really big, um, is sending it via email. Because sometimes certain, you know, if a file is really big, the email um, won't send it, usually bigger than 10 megabytes. But um, pen drives work as well. Um, Facebook is another way to do it. And then the WhatsApp, which I'll talk about a little later as well. Um, if Bluetooth isn't common where you are, what other ways could you easily transfer files? Dropbox. I didn't think about Dropbox. Um, Google Drive is another one that you can use as well. Um, and someone's mentioning Volki here. Pen drives. Um, I'm not sure how pen drives would work getting a getting a cell phone file to a to a computer but if if you used it via a USB cord maybe that would work um, Instagram um, so there's a lot of things uh, that you can use so um, one of the advantages of cell phone stories um, that I found is that it gets students talking. Um, it gives them a purpose for creating language, which is one of the biggest challenges we as teachers have, creating you know, a real type situation for students to produce the language. Um, it uses technology that students are familiar with and aren't used to using in school. So you know, when you say, take out your cell phone, they're all going to look at you and say, are you crazy? No. Well, you told us we can't, and so it's kind of fun. Um, it fosters critical thinking skills. It encourages students to write. Um, it encourages communication and collaboration. Um, it gives students a voice. So, as I said, the students who didn't want to stand in front of the camera, they stood behind the camera, and they... Um, videoed what they drew and I thought that was just really really a great idea so um, students who didn't normally talk really started to produce a lot of language it encourages creativity um, uh, the question from Makiko in Japan about how it, how it develops critical thinking um, the for more advanced students that I've used this with um, I had them think about how to give advice to first-time conference goers or first-time presenters and so they had to communicate and decide you know what best pieces of advice they could um, that would be most useful for um, the video that they were making um, again you can kind of see that on the name the resources that I've put on there I put two videos one that beginning students did and one a group of teachers produced at a conference um, so hopefully that answers your question. Um, it does connect what they learn to what goes on outside of the classroom. Um, they get to talk about, they get to personalize what they, you know, they're learning. Um, they're fun. <laughs> I saw all the students laughing, especially when they listened to their recordings. Uh, they, you know, would ask, I really sound like that? That's great. That's crazy. Um, they try to get it right, which was the best biggest advantage to me is that they repeat and they repeat because they want to not because I was asking them to and um, you know I thought that was great um, more speaking I mean there's so many other advantages that many of you are talking about motivation um, uh, they have a chance to express their talent um, a photography maybe even too um, Hidden potential can come out. Uh, Jenna from Senegal said that. I think that's great. <laughs> Safa from Egypt says it's edutainment. Sure. When you go back and you listen to um, 
and share these stories. Students love it. You know, I uh, at the end of class, if you're even able to play one or two, um, they they really get a, a a lot of enjoyment out of it. So um, I like Safa saying that it actually maximizes learners' autonomy as well. So um, here are a couple of examples um, or topics that you can use for cell phone stories. Um, <clears throat> you can uh, use introductions like I showed you. Uh, you can do a short group story about an event, like um, you can do it like a news event. Um, you can explain and show part of one's culture or an activity. Um, they can show and explain recipes. Uh, they can explain inventions. Uh, they could do city or school tours. Um, you know, these are things that you can send groups out to do outside, send, send them to do outside of the classroom. Um, I do think it's important with anything that you do with these is that you make sure the learners prepare beforehand before they start filming because otherwise it will be really hard to help them get organized. So the storyboard uh, in my opinion, um, really helps them get organized so they know how they're going to go about doing their recording. So, um, again, it's something that, um, you know, makes students more curious and eager to learn um, and gets them involved in with technology that is going to be really useful for them outside of the school environment. So, um, so, you know, Safa just gave another interesting thing, summarizing a chapter in a novel or an act in a play. Sure, I think those are great. Uh, so, you know, the more topics, if you can share those with us in our discussions afterwards, that would be great. Uh, but the main thing for me is that they get a purpose for doing something, and I think that's um, something that we really need to keep focusing on as we go along. Okay, um, the third activity that many of you have talked about is using cell phones for voice recording. Um, these are just some examples. The teacher records a passage or a song. Um, they can do one of many things. They can send it out to students via Bluetooth uh, or a text message or even play it in class. Um, um, after listening to, let's say, I'm talking uh, about a passage, after listening, the students try to reproduce it um, on their phones or in a group of students, um, recording it, um, focusing on tone, intonation, and natural breaks. Um, and on this one, teachers can choose whether they want to hear the student use it, I'm sorry, hear the students, or have the students use it for self-directed practice because many of you again deal with classes of 50, 70, 80 um, and you don't want to receive all these messages from students that often they're just practicing uh, so you know you can choose for them to share it with a friend instead of having them send it to you um, but you know do make sure that you know they know what they're going to do with it afterwards um, but, you know, yeah, like I say, be careful of asking all the students to send it to you because we don't want to create more work than, you know, teachers already have. So, um, but this is a way to kind of think about pronunciation and having them focus on pronunciation. I know when I record myself learning other languages, I, I like to try and, and imitate what I hear from other people just so that I can, um, you know, work on um, sounding more intelligible because <laughs> uh, it's not always easy. Um, so I talked about ways to distribute listening material for autonomous learning. So again, um, you know, students don't always have access to this material, but many teachers often do. Um, and, you know, your recordings, uh, you can record something, a passage, a summary, something that you want them to listen to and then maybe write a summary about it, you can send it to them. Um, or if you're using a website, you can send it to that website. Class recording, students, you talked about putting it on to, uh, some people talked about putting it onto a blog or, or, or um, 
another website or a class website, you can do that. Um, podcasts, many of you have talked about podcasts. Students can create their own um, on a topic. This is great for intermediate and, and advanced classes. I think it's something that they could, you know, each has a topic and then they can create an individual podcast. I would do this in groups, maybe not individuals, and they can send it to other people. Um, audiobooks, I'm going to talk a little bit about that, a little bit more about that later. And songs, and if you don't have the song, you could send a song link as well. Um, again, I'm wary of doing everything with internet because not everybody has access to the data packages, and sometimes they can be a little bit expensive. So, um, so if you have this material on your phone, how do you use it? There's, and, and if the students have it on their phone, how do they use the material? Um, easiest way um, is to connect your cell phone to speakers. As a teacher, you can take your take an audio cable and plug it into a speaker, and then plug the other into a cell phone, and you have an instant listening activity. Um, those are great for. Um, for classes that don't have CD players or don't have very good audio and you know teachers can buy just simple speakers and and plug them into their phone and boom they have an instant activity. Um, Janity from um, Pungawan has asked about using Siri which is uh, the voice activation um, software, I think, with Apple. Um, I haven't tried it in my class, um, and I know many students don't have an iPhone. But yeah, I guess it's I guess it's doable. But it would be great to hear how you've used it. So um, another thing is when you send send material to students that you want them to listen to, many of them already do this. They connect headphones and they listen to the material at home or in their free time. And this is what many schools get frustrated about because students are, um, you know, uh, always listening to their phones. So um, that's one of the ways that you can get an instant kind of listening activity for your classes. Um, so I'm going to move forward a little bit and get to something that was new to me when I first came back here. <laughs> um, I'm going to get into some cell phone terminology. Um, there are two types of cell phones out in the world out there. Uh, smartphones. These are your phones that are, you know, your iPhones, your Android phones, your touchable phones that have all those app stores. Um, and um, the other one is for feature or what I like to call basic phones. Uh, feature was a term I didn't even know until I started working here uh, in DC. So um, most of the activities I've talked about today, I've focused on things that you can do with basic phones because that's what the majority of people have. Um, and so what I'm going to talk about next um, is what you can do and what's available for these feature, I'm sorry, for these basic phones. So um, again, many of you have students who have phones, but many of those phones are just your basic phones. Majority of the basic phones nowadays have at minimum a microphone capability, a picture taking capability, and often a video recording capability. So. Um, that's one of the things that I want you to think about. And then many of these phones do have a way to access the Internet. Um, I've been in classes where there's not a lot of electricity um, and there's no wireless in the school or anything like that, but, you know, I've seen students circled around the phone looking up some information on a dictionary or on Google or on Wikipedia. So many of these phones do have that capability. So, thinking about that, um, on these basic phones, 
um, there are organizations and companies that are working really hard to make sure reading material is available um, to students. So, um, so the one thing that is happening out there, and I'm going to talk about the AE app, um, is that students can listen to and follow along with audiobooks on basic phones. Um, teachers, you know, can work with a specific chapter on something they're they're reading. Um, and create graphic organizers. Um, so the students show in these graphic organizers what happened and then they predict what will happen next and then maybe the next day you send the next chapter out. Um, so remember what I said earlier today is that students never forget their phones but they always forget their books. This is the way to get them to um, have that reading material when you want them to have it. But the question is, how do you get books or book chapters on basic phones? Well, um, many of you have been exposed to this American English app. Um, and to get the app, you would go ahead and type in this address uh, to your mobile phone browser. And this application, it has 15 American English publications. Uh, that we've produced here in our office. Um, eight ebooks uh, available to download, one chapter at a time because memory is often an issue. Um, and then there are three CDs. You remember that wonderful music you were listening to today? Um, that many of those songs are available for download, one song at a time. And these, this application is only for basic phones and for Android phones. So it's great. I have it on my phone. I have a simple old Nokia phone, um, and I have this app, and I'm able to get music and books that are free. And um, on the app, there is an external link to World Reader uh, for even more books. Um, so through that app, you can get that link. So um, I encourage you to, you know, pass that on to your students so that you know they have access to more material. Um, you know, that's really what we all struggle with is getting the material out to our students and, and getting them access. So, um, you know, let us know how you're using that. I'd love to find out. Um, so, many of us have talked today about the potential challenges to using cell phones. Um, the three that I can think of um, is not all students may have one. Um, losing control of the classroom is kind of a big issue. Many of you have said 70 students in a classroom is really hard to control when I ask them all to put out a cell phone or pull out a cell phone. And then, of course, you have to be wary of cost of the phones and um, wireless services, um, especially here in the USA. Um, we in the USA get charged for receiving a text message, which I think is really funny. I've never seen that in any other country. <laughs> um, so, um, how do we take care of these problems? If not all students have a phone, um, one of the ways that you can do this um, is to do group projects requiring only one phone per group. Um, you, in this sense, it helps the group focus and it lets students without phones participate. So no phone, no problem. We can always adapt. Um, I think another thing that I've read that's really, really interesting is that schools could have a class cell phone for students who don't have one. Um, you know, you can you know, you can maybe find a way to, or even in your home, you may have an, an extra, a second cell phone that you don't use anymore that you can use for your class phone, and um, that way students who don't have a phone, you know, you might be able to, um, you know, let them use it in class, and that's another way to kind of monitor how many are using the phone. So if, if, you're, if you are able to convince your school to... Um, of the value of using them in class instead of having students bring them 
you can have a class set of, you know, I don't know, 10 cheap phones and use them, uh, and then you don't have to deal with the students bringing it in. So, um, but, you know, that, that's the idea. Um, and many of you are giving some other ideas, so, um, you know, surely with phones students don't follow classroom lessons. Sure, and I'm going to talk about that here in a second. Um, so, this one, classroom control. <laughs> um, first and foremost, I think you need to get students, parents, and school administrators to consent to using phones for learning activities. Um, I believe that the more information you give parents, um, the more likely they are to support the idea. Um, the more that you can show administrators the value that it brings to your classroom, the more that you can get your schools to buy into the idea. I think it's really, really important that you that you you bring everybody into the conversation. Um, you know, the other thing is is explain your objectives for the activities and why you're using the phones. Um, and then the most important, and I think this is this is true for any activity you do, um, whether you're using technology or not, um, you must establish rules and guidelines for proper and improper use of phones during learning activities. Um, so here's an example um, of one rule. Uh, you can only SMS or text for classwork. Um, during class. Cell phones should only be visible when needed to complete class activities. At every other time, at every other time, there should be, you should not see the cell phones in your, you know, in your classroom. So, um, you know, that that's one of the big things. So this is the this is the thing. You must, in order to make any classroom work, you have to establish order and you have to establish rules for whatever you do. So um, by setting the ground rules, you can really have an, a very interesting um, lesson. But if you don't, you are going to have chaos. You are going to have a lot of trouble. So um, before doing any activity with the phone, think about why you want to do it, your objectives, and think about the strategies and the way in which you're going to implement it. And of course, I always bring in the school, the administrators, and the parents because we no, the last thing any of us want is for something to happen, a phone gets stolen or a phone get broken, gets broken or something like that. So um, these kind of rules are really, really important. And, and really the bottom line is, you know, manage your classroom so that you can get the activities, the most out of the activities. So um, that's that's the big thing. But in the end, really, I think the phones motivate students. So, um, you know, any type of different type of learning where the students are really taking control is, is really motivating for them. So um, the next challenge or the next problem is a big one. <laughs> um, cost of services. Um, be very careful um, because we don't want to put any extra burden of, of money on students. Uh, we don't want students to, you know, um, pay any more than they they necessarily normally do. So find out, you know, how much SMSs and text cost because they do cost money. Wireless services cost money and it's different in every country. Um, some countries it comes all packaged together, other countries it doesn't. Um, and so, you know, find that out beforehand with students and find out what is going to be useful for them. Again, that goes back to what I was talking about of bringing the students, the parents, and school administrators all into the same into the conversation. Um, so again, pay attention to those. Um, when at all possible, try to limit the data or internet use. 
Um, instead, you know, use the recording features. Um, send messages via Bluetooth when possible. Um, you know, there are some amazing things that are being used, That how phones are being used all over the world. Um, you know, there are banks, are, people are able to transfer money and pay to people's accounts, um, you know, via, via the phone, which is something we don't even do here. Um, and so phones are, you know, really, really, you know, the, people use them for all different sorts of activities and reasons. And so just pay attention. Try to limit the use. And finally, if you do use text messaging, I think apps, many of you mentioned it, I think apps such as um, WhatsApp, or many people call it WhatsApp, um, is an application that you get you know, free international text messaging anywhere in the world. Um, it, it is free for one year, and then I think after that, um, it's like 99 cents for one year. But for some reason, um, I've had it on my phone for three years, and it never seems to ask me for that 99 cents. So um, I don't know what's happening. But, um, you know, I think it's, it's, it's a really good application. I communicate with people all over. And you can send video links, and you can send, um, and you can send uh, uh, audio links from all over. And so that's a really good application. Um, Textmeforfree.com is another website that um, people can use to send text messages. So um, uh, that's something you can all check out. And I'm sure many of you guys have a lot of other options that I haven't even thought of. So, um, and I know wireless is an issue, um, but WhatsApp works for works, you know, um, with whatever data plans are available. So, um, but Text Me Free is a good app. So, um, you know, please everybody share the share the links that you have and that you know um, on the name with all of us. Um, so we're coming down to the um, final few minutes of our webinar. I've got a, a few more things for you, um, but I want you to keep in mind before you, before we go off the air today. Um, you know, th three things to remember about technology. Um, technology is a tool. Um, use it to create and make things. That's what it's there for, and that's what we're using it for. Um, you know, technology is something that changes. Um, so you need to be agile. Um, you know, you need to keep improving. You need to keep improving as the technology keeps improving. And finally, um, which is the best thing that we can all do, is let the learners help you. They grow up with this technology. We... <laughs> Um, being older, we have to learn the technology, and they grow up with it. So often, let them help you. Bluetooth was something I learned from my my students. They were the ones who said, "Oh, we can Bluetooth the video to you," and I didn't even think about that. So, um, you know, consider that when you're when you're um, working with this technology. Often, the students know so much more than we do, and we sometimes take that for granted. Um, so. Um, that comes from a video um, presented at TEDx London, so you can take a look at that, and I think you'll really like it. Um, technology um, is a challenge for big classes, but again, um, just with any situation with big classes, I think you can you can make it work. So, um, everyone, uh, you thought this was going to be easy and you're going to get away without having to do any work today, but I'm going to give you a little bit of a quiz, okay? You guys ready for a quiz? No? You guys are all running away? All right. All right, here goes. Let's see if you uh, remember anything that we talked about today. First question is... What are three different ways to use photos from a phone?
Introductions, great. Writing stories, great. And photos of families. All right. Picture studies, Q&A stories, okay. Well, there are many more answers than three, which is fine. The answer for that one is uh, you can describe a picture to a partner. You can take photos of English in the environment. And you can talk about family or places. The next question is, what helps organize the story for cell phone stories? Storyboards. Yay, everybody got that. All right. What is the easiest way to transfer videos from a phone? Bluetooth, okay. Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, all right. For me, it's been Bluetooth, but it can be Bluetooth or a USB cord. Okay, and there are other ways that I gave you, but for me, I found those the two easiest. And the next question is, you guys are all doing really well. I think you've all almost got 100%. What application gives smartphone capability to feature phones or otherwise known as basic phones? No, no, you guys haven't gotten it yet. No. Oh, no. Everyone's forgotten. A.E. Sarah in Sudan. Good job, Sarah. The A.E. app. Um, that is going to give capabilities of smartphones to all those basic phones out there. Remember, it's the A.E. app. Um, I'm sure our moderators will put that up for you soon. The next question I have for you is our last question of the day, which is, does a phone have to be connected to the internet to use it for language learning? No, the answer is no. Ding, 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 ding. Everybody gets a prize today. And the prize is knowledge. All right. So, everybody, what's next? Uh, here are some resources. Um, these two websites are up on the Ning, so you can go ahead and look on the resources for those. Finally, the last thing I have for you today is for you to think about what's next. Um, please join the discussion on the Ning. Download resources from the Ning. And please, if you do any cell phone video stories, please send your mobile videos and other cell phones in the classroom uh, to me on the Ning. I would love to see what you're doing out there. Everybody, thank you very much. And I'll leave you with the saying, uh, because I love stories. Say it. The universe is made of stories, not atoms. Have a great evening, and thanks for joining us on Webinar Wednesday.